Assembly. A family of programming languages that communicate directly with the CPU and whose syntax may look stupidly convoluted if you've never looked at it before. As someone who really likes programming in C, I've always wanted to learn assembly, but I never knew where to start. Until a few weeks ago when I was scrolling through Reddit and I found this book called Programming from the Ground Up, which is aimed at newcomers who want to get started with programming. And yes, I mean programming, not just assembly. The author doesn't fuck around at all. He quite literally says, if you want to learn programming, don't be a bitch and start with assembly. So I decided to give the book a try, learn a few things here and there, and make a video about it because it's it's been a hundred years since the last time I uploaded something and I don't want YouTube to shadow ban me. Now take everything I'm gonna say here with a grain of salt, because I'm just a dude making a YouTube video and not a college professor. Before I get into the actual details of assembly code, there are a few things I need to point out, so bear with me for a few seconds. As I mentioned at the start of the video, assembly is not exactly one programming language. It's more like a family of languages. Assembly communicates directly with your CPU, so depending on the CPU's architecture, the way you communicate with it will vary. Now, the book I'm reading was written back in 2003. That's more than 20 years ago, so naturally, it focuses on writing assembly for an x86 32-bit architecture using the old AT&T syntax. Now, don't worry about the technicalities of it, even though various assembly languages languages may look very different from one another, they all follow, at least as far as I'm aware, the same basic principles. Keep in mind that I'll be simplifying a lot of things, because I don't want this video to be too long. The thing on the left is your computer's CPU. The thing on the right is your memory. Your memory is divided into bytes, and each byte has its own unique address. Your CPU uses these addresses to find all the information it needs to operate. In a 32-bit architecture, addresses are 32 bits wide. On a basic level, your computer can only perform simple operations. Usually add, subtract, compare, multiply, and things like that. So in order to run a program, the CPU checks whatever is in the memory and it performs operations on it. To accomplish this, the CPU uses registers to pass data from the memory to itself and back. To better illustrate the whole process, let's use the following assembly program as an example. The main part of this program is this line, start. In assembly, this is called a label. Since assembly is very low level, it involves a lot of jumping back and forth different memory addresses. To make this easier, we use labels to refer to these memory addresses, so we don't have to memorize them. You can see that the label is defined as global. This just means that this label is exposed to the linker so we can use it as an entry point for the program. And if that sounds confusing, you can think of it as the main function in C. Then we get three instructions. We move the number 1 to the EAX register, we move the number 0 to the EBX register, and the final line initiates a system call to the Linux operating system. The dollar sign in front of the number just means that we are moving a constant value to the register. The instruction move L is used to move data from one place to another. The L at the end of the instruction stands for long, which means that we're moving 4 bytes. You can think of system calls as asking the operating system for help. You interrupt the execution of your program and the operating system takes care of the rest. The end here stands for interrupt. They allow you to do things such as opening files, reading and writing data, forking, and in this case, exiting the program. Different system calls require you to pass different data in the registers before calling them. This is sort of like passing parameters to a function in a higher level language. As you can see in this table, for an x86 32-bit processor, the system call 1 will exit the program. In order to call it, we need to assign the number 1 to EAX and put the status code in EBX. So this can sort of be translated to the following C program. See? Very simple. Learning programming from books is fun and everything, but sometimes it gets too boring. You need to add some spice to your programming journey. That's why today's sponsor, boot.dev, is a great opportunity for you. Boot.dev is essentially gamifying the learning process. The main focus of it is to teach you backend development from start to finish in Python and Go programming languages. And as we all know, backend is the goaded part of web development. Through a hands-on approach, you can learn topics such as data structures and algorithms, functional programming, HTTP servers and clients, Git, Docker, and more stuff like that. Each course is split into digestible small lessons so you can reach your goals by just being consistent. It also offers a variety of coding projects so you can expand your GitHub portfolio with actual finished stuff. You gotta write lots of code to learn how to code, right? But what about the gamifying part? Well, besides the fact that it's got a cool RPG theme going on, it also includes XP, levels, achievements, quests, leaderboards, and all the other things you can think of. There are even bi-monthly boss fights where the community rallies together to gain bonus XP for each lesson completed during the event. If you want to try it by yourself, go to boot.dev and use my code MULT to get 20% off your entire first year if you choose the annual plan. With that being said, thanks to boot.dev for sponsoring this video. Now here comes the part that every programmer does when learning a new language, writing hello world. And here it is. See, it's not that bad. Here we have defined a label named fuck that contains our message. We have to specify that it contains ASCII values. An interesting thing you'll notice is that since labels represent memory addresses, we can use labels to calculate the length of our message by doing this, where the dot is just the memory address after defining the string. So this just means fuck len is equals to fuck len minus fuck. Then we want to use a system call to write to our terminal. As you can see, we're using the system call number four. That's because printing in the terminal works the same way as writing to a file. The main difference is that we have to pass the file description 
descriptor of STD out. I realized that maybe I need to explain what a file descriptor is. Well, you can think of it as an identifier that lets you access a file. And at least in this case, STD out will always be file descriptor one. So in order to use the write system call, we need to have the following data in our registers. EAX should contain the number call for in this case, EBX should contain the file descriptor one for STD out, ECX should contain the message fuck, and finally EDX should contain the length of the message and bytes, fuck len in this case. Then we initiate the system interrupt and voila, we have printed hello world. Kind of. As I mentioned previously, in assembly, labels allow you to jump to different memory addresses. This is very useful when you want to repeat an instruction multiple times. And if all that sounds familiar to you, it's because I'm talking about loops. Here's an example of a simple loop. This program will print the word cringe 10 times in the terminal. As you can see, we're using mostly the same instructions as before. We define the label named cringe and we calculated the length of it. Then we start our program. We move 0 to the index register, EDI, and 10 to the ECX register. We'll use the index register to keep track of how many times we have executed the loop. Then we go into our start loop label. Here we compare the index with the number of times we want to execute the loop, 10 in this case. If the number is greater or equal, we jump to the exit loop label. Otherwise, we print the word cringe and we increment the index. The following instructions, which I have no idea how to pronounce, are used to jump to different labels. If it helps, you can imagine this assembly program as the following C program. In a real translation, you wouldn't declare the registers as variables, but it should help you understand the logic better. Functions in assembly are fucking difficult to explain in a short video, but I'll do my best. Functions are just regions of memory that contain instructions that your program executes. Does that sound familiar? Because it's the same fucking thing we've been doing so far with jumping between labels. Then what's the difference between a function and a fucking label? Well, functions usually can take parameters, so you can execute instructions inside them. So how do you pass data to functions in assembly? I know I'm doing this asking questions to myself too often, but I don't know how else to explain stuff. Anyway, there's no specific way of doing it, but what exists is something called calling conventions which specify how different programming languages pass data to functions. Now this is a good time to remind you that I'm basing most of my information on a 20 year old book. To follow the x86 calling convention, all you have to know is that there is something called the stack. The stack is just a region in your computer's memory that gets assigned for your program's execution. Now this is a bit counterintuitive, but the top of the stack is actually towards the bottom of the memory. So lower memory addresses are on top, and the more the stack grows, the more it goes to the bottom of the memory. So in x86, whenever you call a function, you push data to the stack. This data usually includes all the parameters you want to pass, as well as the return address of the function. Now you might be thinking, why do I need to do that? Wouldn't it just be easier to store the data you want to use in the registers? And the answer is... Probably. I, I don't know. I think x64 uses registers to pass some data, but due to the limited number of registers of x86, you can't really guarantee that the data in your registers won't be overridden when you call a function. So it's just safer to push it to the stack. Remember, 20 year old book. Once you're inside the function, you can retrieve these parameters that were saved in the stack by performing simple operations. In x86, whenever you call a function by doing this, the return address is automatically pushed to the stack. This will allow you to return to the previous function once you're done with the current one. There is also something called the stack pointer. I know there are a lot of fucking things to remember, but I promise it gets easier after understanding functions. Anyway, the stack pointer ESP always points to the top of the stack whenever you push or pop something. So whenever you push, ESP decrements. And whenever you pop, ESP increments. So what's the fucking point of all this? Well, usually when you call a function, you would write something called the function prolog. Here you simply push EBP, which is the base pointer, and then make EBP point to ESP. And I'm still fucking confused right now, but it makes sense, I promise. The main purpose of this, at least according to what I understood, is to create a new stack frame for the function. In x86, if I have to say x86 one more time, I'm gonna fucking kill myself. You usually initialize local variables by pushing them into the stack. So by doing this, you can store as many variables as you can without getting a fucking stack overflow. And once you finish the execution, you can just return to the previous stack frame by doing this. This is called the function epilogue. You just make the stack pointer point to the base pointer and pop the base pointer. I really hope this is easier to understand with the video because I'm so fucking lost reading my script right now. And this is why local variables can only be accessed within the functions they were defined in. At least in programming languages that make sense like C and I don't know, Java, maybe, I don't know, don't quote me on that. The last instruction in the epilogue, fret, is used to return to the previous program. This instruction will pop the last value in the stack and jump to that memory address. That's why it's important to restore the stack to the original state. Otherwise, who knows what kind of wacky shenanigans will happen. If you need, before doing the epilogue, you can also assign any return value you want into EAX. This is the register that is conventionally used to store the return values of functions. And I know that was a lot of information to process, so here's an example of a simple program that uses a function to find the maximum number in a list of long integers. And this is the same example, but written in C. I'm not gonna explain the whole program because the video is already too fucking long and I really wanna eat something now, so I'll just summarize the basic idea. Try to pause it and read the code. In a similar way as the C program, we define our variables in the data section, and we call the findMax function by pushing the address of the first element of the list to the stack. This is equivalent of passing a pointer to a function in C. Inside the function, we initialize the stack frame with the function prolog 
will get the parameter passed to the function. The number 8 here indicates the offset from the base pointer where the parameter is stored. And it's 8 because we've pushed 4 byte variables every time. Then we can follow our C program to better understand the logic. In assembly, if we have a register inside a parenthesis, it means that we're accessing the value stored in the memory address pointed by the register. So it would be something similar to doing this in C. Another thing to notice is that while in assembly we have to write add 4 to move to the next element because we're dealing with longs, in C, we can just do data items plus plus. This is because the C compiler automatically knows the data type and it will increment it accordingly. Finally, we assign the maximum number to the EAX register, which is usually used to store the return value and execute the function epilog. Back in the main program, we need to clean this tag after calling the find max function. Then we push the necessary data for the printf function. Yes, this is the same printf function you know from C. So we need to push both the format string and the number we want to print. Finally, in a similar way, we clean the stack and call the exit function. And I know this was very confusing to explain, but if you're still with me, that's pretty cool. All the examples I used and some other programs that I wanted to showcase in this video, but I couldn't because it was too long, are in my GitHub profile. So you can just go there and check them out. Also follow me there because I like the cloud. And this has been my journey so far learning assembly. I hope you enjoy the video and hopefully you can try it out. Also, you can join my Discord server if you want. I don't really answer that many messages, so sorry about that. But I was very busy this like a couple of weeks, so I hope you understand.